has responded to the increasing number of queer people in the New Zealand Defence Force, and it is a organisation that is established to provide the peer support, guidance and advice to the New Zealand Defence Force's uh, queer community and commanders and managers. It was established in 2012 and has received a Supreme Award in the ANZ EEO Trust Diversity Awards. So I'd like to introduce the author. Hey, kia ora, ladies and gentlemen. Um, my name is Stu Pearce. Uh, I am a, a squadron leader in the Royal New Zealand Air Force. I'm also the chair of the Overwatch group. Um, now, I'm very conscious that this is a, a youth leadership conference, and um, unfortunately for me, my youth is a bit of a dim and distant mystery. But as a, um, as a senior officer in the military, uh, I do know or do have some experience of leadership. Now, I could sit here and talk for hours about what I believe leadership to be, but instead, I'm going to just touch very briefly on what I don't believe leadership to be about. I don't believe leadership is about solely amassing followers. If you're a leader and, and your sole priority is how many people are following you, then I think you're doing it wrong. I think what leadership is about is about empowering leadership with others. It's about building people up. It's about nurturing potential so that everybody around you can, meet, can be the absolute very best that they can be. Now I'm very pleased uh, and I'm delighted really to be able to introduce two of the two um, rising stars of the New Zealand Defence Force. We have a, uh, a proud history in the NZDF that uh, some of our most courageous and outstanding acts of leadership have been carried out by our youngest and most junior people. So the two people I'm going to introduce this morning are Corporal Hemi Fryers and uh, Sapper Gates in Evelston. Corporal Fryers is the uh, Deputy Chair of Overwatch. Uh, he's also one of the group's founders, and he's been a, the backbone, essentially, of what we've been doing with the Overwatch organisation pretty much for the last four years. He's represented Overwatch here in New Zealand, as well as overseas. He's worked with our friends and allies from the United States, as well as Australia and elsewhere. As the most junior member of the Overwatch Management Group, or the OMG, uh, he... <laughs> He represents the junior members of the New Zealand Defence Force as well, and, and I, I say this without a degree of exaggeration, he has undoubtedly contributed to the well-being of our young people. The next person I want to talk about is Sapper Tracy Eagleston. Tracy has been a staunch supporter of Overwatch since we pretty much launched in early 2012. She's been a regular fixture of all of our community events that we do, so out in the square, big, big gay out, uh, the parade events like this, and has walked um, so, you know, talk and engage with the community and talk about her experiences and her, her life as a, a junior person within an organisation like ours. For me, the standout moment for Tracy, though, and I think we're going to see this a little bit later on, is when she volunteered to be part of our It Gets Better video. Now, if you haven't heard of the It Gets Better movement, it's an, an international movement aimed at targeting uh, queer youth suicide and sending a message of hope to our uh, LGBTIQ people um, in crisis. And I absolutely commend uh, Tracy's courage in uh, volunteering to do that. So I've probably embarrassed them both more than enough already, so I'll shut up and I'll hand over to those guys and uh, I'll let them take it from here. Thank you. Uh, good morning. So as you said, my name is Tracy. I'm a sapper with the New Zealand Army. Um, oh, thanks to you for his words. What I would say about what he said about leadership and what I've done is simply that at the end of the day, if you want the world to be better, if you want where you live, what you do to be better, then the only person you can rely on to do that is yourself. And you have to rely on yourself to stand up. And at the end of the day, that is all I do. I stand up for my for my mates, I stand up for my family, and I stand up for my friends. But this morning we're here to talk to you about inclusion and diversity in the workplace. This is something that the New Zealand Army has managed to get itself to be quite a leader in the community and in, and in the business environment. So to start with, we'll talk about what inclusion is. Inclusion covers three things. It's representation, receptivity, and fairness. So representation is about having precedence and having visibility. It's not enough to be there, but you need to be seen to be there. This is especially important with the rainbow community because at the, contrary to what TV makes you think, we do genuinely just look like everybody else. <laughs> Maybe a little more fabulous, but like everybody else. And it's important that 
we contribute to the decision making processes that occur in, in your businesses and in your community groups because everybody brings a different point of view and the more points of view you have, the more likely you're going to get a better outcome. Second thing is receptivity and that's the willingness for everybody involved to be willing to listen to everybody else. You know, it, you, when somebody talks, you need to listen because if you, even if you bring good ideas to the table, if nobody's willing to listen to the ideas, then they're not going to get anywhere. And the third net thing is fairness. It's about basically everybody having the same opportunities. So everybody gets a shot at the same promotion, regardless of your gender or your race or who you're dating or, or your religion or anything else. What inclusion is not, is it's not diversity. And it's, they sound like the same thing, but they're not. Diversity is just, it just is. It's like the weather, you know, you will get sunny days and bad days, and it just is. Inclusion is an active thing. It's something that people have to actively do to make the effort to make everybody feel like they're involved. And it adds value to the environment, and it adds value to, to the organisation. And organisations that aren't inclusive, lose that value because they lose the ability to make people feel like they can contribute and then they lose those contributions. Why does it matter? Well, I've already started talking about it, but for individuals, it gives you a greater sense of self-worth, improved morale, better workplace relationships, stronger job focus, empowerment and support. To me, all of this comes back to the simple concept of it makes people happy. Which sounds like such a simple thing, but every, at the end of the day, we, nobody wants to get up and go to a job that makes them miserable. Nobody wants to get up and go to a job where they feel like they're, they're not safe. And so being inclusive creates that environment. It makes people happy. It gives people the opportunities that they desire. And it gives them the opportunity to grow and to live a full, rewarding life, you know, that's not limited by who they are. And the big one, this to me is the important one, is why it's important for businesses. Because some of you are going to go back, you're going to want to go back and start doing this in your workplaces or with your communities. So it's important to be able to talk to your bosses and to your people on how it benefits them. Because if you can get them to find why it benefits them, it becomes a lot easier to get them to agree, agree to get on board. And the first thing is it makes good business sense. Because it encourages and promotes the reputation. It makes businesses look good. We've now got to the point as a society that being inclusive is seen as a good thing and not being inclusive actually makes your business look bad. So helping your boss to see that it encourages his business to look good and look good to his customers actually works very well. You also see a greater effect from your personnel and improved recruitment and a reduced attrition rates. And again, this comes back to what I said, if you make your workers happy. And if you make your workers happy, they become more productive. Again, it sounds like very simple concepts, but it's sometimes the simplest things are the truths. You know, you make your people happy, they contribute more, they contribute more, things work out better for everybody. And they found that in Stonewall in the UK, that employee, employees who are out at work are actually less likely to leave. They're less likely to go, well, if I'm miserable, I'm going to leave. But if they're out and they're happy, they tend to stay. And the other thing is it limits risks. And this is to do with harassment. And I know most of us at some point would have experienced bullying or harassment because of who we are. You cannot have homophobia in the workplace and have an anti-discrimination policy. The two concepts are mutually exclusive. <laughs> So, and these days you will see a lot of bosses talk about we don't want bullying, we don't want harassment. Well, this is part of where they need to come on board because if you want to get rid of that harassment, you've got to get rid of all types of harassment. And when you reduce, focus on reducing the bullying, again, you make it just a better place for everybody to work. Now, how do you go about doing this? 
Each case is unique because every environment's different, you know. Some environments are big, like the New Zealand Army, where we're talking 12, 13,000 people, and some of them you're talking about little places which might only have a dozen workers. But there are a lot of resources out there and a lot of different ways of doing things. You could use a combination of equal employment policies. In the NZDF, we have anti-discrimination policies. And what these do is they lay down the backbone of what is and what is not acceptable. So if something does go wrong, you've got a starting point to say, here's the ground rules, you make the ground rules or you don't. You know? And it gives you that protection and that fallback point. Diversity training. Again, this is going to depend on the size of your workplace. If there's five people in your workplace, you're probably not going to need to run diversity training every time somebody starts. But if you're working in a bigger environment where you're going to get a lot of different people, it can be helpful. We talked when we were at the Pride and Defence conference last year, we had the speaker from Coca-Cola come down and talk to us. And they do something called a diversity walk, where they give everybody a different type. So, you, so they might give the white guy a, 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 a label saying, you're now an Indian woman, or you're now this, and get people to see how they would feel in a work environment if they be willing to speak up if they were this person, getting them to understand the different, you know, what it's like to be in somebody else's sho shoes. And these type of trainings can give everybody an understanding of what it's like to be in someone else's shoes. Again, you can use the diversity structure, which is what we have here with Overwatch, which provides people with the opportunity to meet and network with other like-minded people, because there's always strength in numbers. Providing with benefits, and that's just as simple as, you know, extending medical benefits to same-sex couples. You know, simple things like that, which just, again, make people feel like they're not being left out or not included simply because they happen to have a boyfriend instead of a girlfriend. And it's also about working with the culture and your positioning and visibility. You know, which again is the peer supporting and about working with your workmates and with your employers and your communities to create a culture that, you know, supports everybody. But the important thing we keep coming back to talking about leadership is that in the army we talk about the concept of self-leadership. That even a lowly sapper like me, and I'm at the bottom of the food chain in the army, is still required to stand up and lead myself. You, you can't rely on other people. If something needs to be done, then you need to get up and do it. If you want this to happen, you have to be the one to make the changes and that's really, really the key thing is it's about be willing to get in and do the money and make it happen. So I'll hand over now to Corporal Fryers who's going to talk to you about the New Zealand Defence Force and what we've done with inclusion and diversity. Thanks everyone. Uh, thank you, Tracy, for your uh, introduction. And as um, the squadron leader has said, I'm Corporal Henry Fryers um, in the Royal New Zealand Air Force. And as he said, I was here at the start for us. And uh, we'll get into this a little bit, but what I'm going to do now is just take us through a bit of a case study of uh, Overwatch and the New Zealand Defence Force so that we can understand maybe some of the things that, that worked for us or didn't work for us and maybe we can take some lessons away about what we as individuals can now take to our own communities, workplaces and organisations. So to give a bit of background, the New Zealand Defence Force is a really, really interesting, interesting place. Um, we have about 14,000 people across the, uh, the Navy, the Army, the Air Force and our civilian staff and really interestingly uh, that's not representative of society. We're all drawn from New Zealand, all New Zealand society and in, in the wider world for our British imports. Uh, we are drawn from society but we don't necessarily represent that very well because we have an organisation that is a majority of people between 17 and 30 years old. We're a very young organisation uh, and we are 79% male. It's a very male dominated society and that's not representative of New Zealand. However, we are still drawn from society and society's views and opinions on, on the issues that affect us still shape the way that our people think and act. And that is a real challenge that we have to deal with, is that we 
aren't the same as society, but we still carry its baggage. The New Zealand Defence Force is an interesting place because we deploy across the world. We have people in all sorts of places uh, doing all sorts of jobs, and those are jobs that range from medical staff to infantry to pilots to sailors, and all of these jobs um, are, are widely varied and are different for each of our people that have to go and, and fill them out. And while we deploy our people all across the world into all sorts of interesting places to do interesting things, we also have to have people that are so responsive that they can drop everything at a moment's notice and rush away to do what the Defence Force needs. And this really became apparent recently with the, uh, the humanitarian aid in the Philippines. Because at the time there was a lot of focus going on with uh, a major exercise that we were running in New Zealand. We were training with our international partners. We had people deployed on different exercises around the world. And yet it became important that we support the Philippines uh, humanitarian aid and everyone drop what they were doing to go and uh, respond to that. And that is a challenge. That is something else that we, uh, another additional pressure that we put on our people in the New Zealand Defence Force. And I guess the, uh, the upshot of this slide really to talk about is that we have a diversity of our own. We're an organisation of 14,000 people that all are different. And that is something that we really have to uh, consider when we're managing and working through. And I think that this is something that we will all uh, see a bit of in our own situations. Whichever community or group we're going back to, we have to deal with the diversity of our own. And like Tracy says, it's not about uh, it's not about diversity because that's everywhere, that's there all the time. What we have to focus on is getting inclusion, which is uh, the cultural shift. So I want to talk a little bit now about Overwatch, and I guess I want to start off with a bit of a story. And uh, Overwatch really started happening uh, in the back of my head when I came out. And I came out in defence in 2009. Um, I'd been in the Air Force for about 18 months, and a friend of mine uh, told me he was gay, and I went, oh, yeah, me too. And I went, holy hell, I've just said that out loud for the first time. And uh, <laughs> it really knocked me for six, actually. And uh, I went away and I thought a lot about it, and I did some research, and, um, and I decided that this was my time, and I went home and I told my, my family, and I told my friends, and I told my work colleagues, and everything went fine. And it was really wonderful, which is so cool. <laughs> Unfortunately, things didn't run quite so smoothly for my friend. And uh, we were posted to different places at the time, so we didn't see lots of each other. But we caught up about six months later, and he had a little bit of a meltdown because things were a little bit tough at the time. And uh, it really got me thinking about uh, the support that we have available. And uh, I went away and did some research. And the New Zealand Defence Force is really, really great. We've got lots of um, support for our people. But in 2009, we had no specific GRBTRQ support. We had uh, support in the terms of our chaplaincy, our psychologist branch, our medical branch, we had welfare facilitators, we had all of these people looking after our people, but we didn't have anyone that really dealt with, um, with queer issues. And that was a bit of a problem at the time. So uh, we started looking at what we could do about that. And that's when I got in touch with um, Squadron of Pierce and where the first initiative was really born. So it started off with us uh, identifying that there was a, a gap here in, in what the support availability and the education was in defence and we went about trying to fix that. But that came with challenges, that came with real issues. Uh, and in the initial days, Progress was really slow and required really uh, constant, focused effort to, to achieve anything. And I look back now at the Defence Force at the time and I understand what was going on. At the time, we were going, undergoing a major restructure and uh, review of our personnel and manning and how things were looking. So an initiative like Overwatch was not really a priority when we were still dealing with just looking after all of our people on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, and, and people in defence were also a little bit anxious about quite what we were out to achieve and I think that the, uh, the rainbow charge over the hill was a little bit of a thing on the minds of some people and it was really important that 
the way we postured ourselves and the way that we sought to get buy-in from our commanders and our managers was that we focused on uh, underlying the importance and the value that we, we brought to the organisation. So we started with really, really small initiatives. We started uh, real, with the realisation that a perfect solution wasn't going to be achievable at first. We had to start off small and build it up. So in 2011, uh, we had the Royal New Zealand Air Force uh, LGBT forum. And we were so, so proud that we had about 20 people in the room. And we had about 10 queer people in the room. <laughs> And an organisation of 14,000 people across defence, that few number was a real victory for us. But what it did is we got key people in the room to talk about issues and start to raise the profile of it. And we had great support from the base commander in Auckland and we had great support from um, some people around defence who were really keen to, achieve, to see this happen. And we were able to make our smallest victory. And that was the start of things really taking off for us. Shortly afterwards, we had uh, a really big win, which was uh, the United States were going through the repeal of Don't Ask, Don't Tell at the time, allowing um, GLBT, uh, GLB people to serve in their military. And we were invited to attend and speak at a conference uh, in the States about inclusion in the military. And we had the support of the Chief of Air Force, which was a, a really, really great top level support uh, for our attendance. And, and Stu and I went to this conference and spoke and, uh, and listened a lot, because we have a lot to learn from the, uh, a different organisation that looks very different. The United States military is about a jillion times bigger than the New Zealand Defence Force. <laughs> in the scheme of Defence Forces and militaries around the world, New Zealand has a small one. And, uh, and it was really, really interesting. <laughs> it was really interesting going and seeing um, the differences that they faced. So the initial progress was slow and quite a lot of effort, and, and it started off with very small baby steps. But as we started to gain momentum, things really started to take off, and we got um, we, we started to really make progress. And things have only been getting um, faster and more hectic for us in the, the last few years. But the big thing was that we managed to achieve support through our key allies. And I can't understate the importance of this enough in an organisation uh, or in a community group that we're working with, but we were a group of people in defence. We were really at the coalface, we we're the workers, uh, but we managed to get the support of really key important people in the New Zealand Defence Force. And I'm talking about people like the Director of All Wellbeing for the New Zealand Defence Force the Principal Defence Chaplain, our Head Chaplain of the Defence Force, and even the Chief of Defence Force, the man at the top, who is fully supportive of the initiative and fully supportive of what we're trying to achieve, and it makes it much easier for us to go about making the cultural changes and the things that we want to do when we have the support of the guy at the top. And because we've got the support of the Chief of Defence, we have the support of the full organisation. And we don't like to go waving his name around the place, but he is supportive of what we like to achieve. And that means that everyone else um, gets on board as well. And what it has led to is, is what we've achieved as Overwatch uh, to date. And I look back over our um, paperwork the other day at at how many things we've done each year. And I remember looking at 2011, we had the RNZAF uh, LGBT Forum and we had the uh, OutSafe Conference in the United States. 2012, we had about six events. Last year, we had about 14. <laughs> this year, I don't think we're going to have enough time to do any more than that because um, it, it is a very busy thing and we are, uh, we're all volunteers. But there are some really key victories that Overwatch has managed to achieve uh, and the organisation, the New Zealand Defence Force, has managed to achieve just by applying constant effort uh, and focus on trying to achieve these initiatives. And the things that we've got up there are, are the EEO Trust Diversity Awards. Um, some of our main events are uh, like the Pride and Defence Conference, the Auckland Pride Festival, out in this week, big gay out. Uh, and the It Gets Better video, which was a really, really big uh, initiative, a really important initiative for us to run and, and release last year. And we're very, very proud uh, of, of that. But as always, we come back to, um, to 
the lessons that we've learned, well, I come back to the lessons that we learn in the Defence Force, and we love talking about leadership and we love quotes. Uh, and this one here, I think, is a really, really interesting one. It's from the Royal Air Force College in Cranwell. And it's talking about, uh, I think, three really important concepts about leadership is direction, example, and inspiration. And if there's anything to take away, I think it's that you can achieve great things in an organisation uh, by leading the leaders, and that's what was important to us. We led the organisation's leadership to, uh, to making the changes that we needed. And that started with direction, with providing a path to achieving something, the education and the goal to aspire to. So we, we directed um, the commanders in the right direction. We set an example for them, and we, uh, we led through action, we went out and achieved things ourselves, we, we were all doing our own things in the, in the, the GLBTIQ community separately, uh, but we also came back to the NZDF and modelled that example to them about what they can do better. We went away and learned from the United States military and brought that back to defence about how we can do things better. So we provided an example to those commanders about how to be leaders. And finally, we, gave, we tried to give some inspiration. And that was about getting people to believe that we could be a better organisation by developing an inclusive culture. We had to get them to be passionate, to be motivated. We had to get them to take ownership of what this meant and then apply those concepts of leadership to the entire organisation. Because Squadron Leader Pierce and I can't change 14,000 people's minds. But the Chief of Defence Force, with the support of all of his subordinates, can. And that was what we had to go out to achieve. So we're really proud to say that uh, Overwatch has done a bit of a job of leading the organisation and leading our leaders to where we've got to today. But we've just recently, I think, reached a point which is really fantastic, where the organisation is leading itself now. And the organisation is, is taking control and uh, pushing uh, the, the uh, barrow forward. And I think that I alluded to before the, uh, the Index Better video was a really, really big victory for us. And so I wanted to, to show you that today because I think that covers off on a lot of those lessons that we can learn about leadership and about how to develop inclusive cultures. And so um, I'll just play that. I have to smile to myself because we, uh, we unveiled that at the Pride and Defence Conference late last year and the uh, Principal Defence Chaplain came up to me afterwards with tears in his eyes and gave me a big hug and he said, Kimmy, I only cry once a year <laughs> and now I'm using my one hug. <laughs> so that concludes um, everything that I uh, had planned to talk about, but I would be absolutely happy at this point if there are any questions uh, for myself or for Tracy or for Squadron Pets.